Hello and welcome back to Heights Library's podcast, Unpacking 1619, where you can explore the interviews we've collected with scholars from around the country, in which we unpack topics relating to race in America. I'm your host, John Pichet, and I'm thrilled to share these interviews with you here. Leslie Picka, professor of sociology at the University of Dayton, discusses her book, Two-Faced Racism, Whites in the Backstage and Front Stage, which examines the racial attitudes and behaviors exhibited by whites in private versus public setting. Here's our discussion from September 29th, 2022. My name is uh, Leslie Pika, and I'm a professor of sociology at the University of Dayton. Thank you. And we'll be talking about your book um, today, Two-Faced Racism, Whites in the Backstage and Front Stage. And uh, you wrote this with Joe Fagan, right? Yes, I did. Yeah. All right. Um, So if you could kind of give us an overview of what the book is and what you hope to accomplish with it. Yeah. So the book um, is uh, really intended to expand on some of the previous research that um, other race scholars have um, conducted that, that shows that depending upon how you ask the questions, you'll get different answers, particularly for white Americans. So there's research by Eduardo Vanilla Silva and Tyrone Foreman, who found that if you ask whites a question on a survey, you'll get different responses than if you ask them in an interview. And so what we wanted to do is really look at, okay, well, what happens when the researcher isn't there? So we asked over a thousand college students across the U.S. to keep um, basically racial diaries. So just kind of tell us, um, you know, keep track in your daily lives. How does race impact your daily life? Um, You know, does it show up in spaces where you weren't expecting it? Does it not show up in spaces that you were expecting it to? So um, so that's really kind of the 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 um, the inspiration for this book. Yeah, and in reading it, I was really struck by how uh, universal the uh, journal entries seem to be. Yes, and we, um, so this project started um, uh, at a Southeastern University, and we're very aware of the sort of Southern bias that we have about race and ethnicity, the sort of sense of, we expect it in the South, you may not expect it so much in, uh, you know, in other areas. So we really wanted to make sure that our sample size was um, pretty broad. So we had um, about 26 colleges and universities across the U.S. And yeah, in terms of geography, the only real difference that we saw was who the target was. So um, in examining the 626 journals written by white students, um, anti-Black racism was by far the most prevalent and um, fairly consistent. But um, we did see more, um, you know, for example, anti-Asian comments in Washington state, areas in the the West Coast, um, anti-Indigenous Native American in some of the, you know, mountainous regions um, that that didn't show up so much in the Southeast and the Midwest. So, um, but really, other than that, that was kind of the the real only kind of geographic um, difference that we saw. Yeah, and maybe you can speak a little bit about what uh, constituted a, a racial event and kind of how you contoured racism in the book. Yeah, and so certainly, um, and that was kind of one of the um, the things that we did for this project is we really asked the students, you know, like you let us know what kind of a racial event was. So, um, so, and, and I've done this in my own classes as well too, and um, have published articles using this as a, as a teaching tool. And so um, really kind of keeping it open-ended in terms of asking the students, um, you know, when does race show up? When does it not show up? I, I can share with you in my own classes with um, especially white students, many of them think initially they're not gonna have anything to write about. And many of them will say things like, race doesn't impact my daily life. And, you know, I'm just kind of doing what it is that I'm doing. And it's not until, you know, we, we do offer some probes, um, you know, think about who you're eating dinner with, who are you hanging out with, who's teaching your classes, um, who's cleaning up the, the garbage, who's serving as custodial workers. Um, and many of the students um, said things like things were hiding in plain sight, that it, they really just sort of needed that little nudge just to pay attention to what was really taking place all around them. Yeah, and I was interested because the um, one of the points you make in the book is in the 1970s, blatant racism is replaced, and we have kind of what is now considered a colorblind or uh, kind of an excuse or justification, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's really one of the things that we look at in the book too, is, um, you know, how do we have conversations about race without ever mentioning race? And so um, in part of the chapters, we look at some of the um, racial code language that's used. So um, talking about good neighborhoods and bad neighborhoods. I hear this from my students all the time where um, it sort of becomes a, a shorthand in terms of for um, racialized social spaces. So especially given how, um, you know, racial segregation is still the norm in our, in our you know, in our culture. And so we have lots of conversations about race without ever actually talking about race. And so um, some have suggested that, you know, racialized hierarchies have just sort of gone underground. We now code it in different ways, whether or not it's related to social class or um, it's not quite as acceptable. Um, although some say, is this changing now? Um, you know, about being sort of overtly expressing an overtly um, racialized or, or racist perception. Well, yeah, that was one of the things that really came out to me, too, is this idea that, you know, white people don't often think about their own race. They're always constantly racializing others, but then they're also always in performance of white yes. racial roles, right? And I think this idea of backstage and front stage talks to that directly. Could you maybe kind of tell us what that means? and how? Yeah, absolutely. And really, so front stage, backstage is, I mean, it's a, a you know, fairly foundational theoretical perspective in sociology. So, you know, dramaturgy. Um, but this was really the first study to apply it to a racialized context. And so basically what front stage says is, you know, it's kind of like all the world is a stage. We're all merely actors. You know, you have your roles that you're playing. And so the front stage is where you're performing. And then in the backstage is where you can relax those expectations. You can prepare for future front stage interactions. I'll share with you that this project also came about from my experiences waiting tables. And I saw this very clearly. So um, I was a server at a well-known, um, you know, establishment and saw Saw this among, you know, my colleagues where, you know, you'll go to the table and hi, how you doing tonight? You know, get it, get you started with a cold frosty beverage. Take a look at the menu. I'll be right back. And then you go in the backstage and you're grumbling and you're angry and you're, but then you come back out to the front stage and, you know, you're all happy again. And so, um, so that's fairly common for especially service work, but, um, but I noticed this in terms of racialized context. So, um, you know, the servers being very polite, being very kind to especially um, patrons of color, but then in the backstage area, uh, making subtle comments. I know I'm not going to get a good tip from that table. And so, um, so you know, using it in, in coded ways or kind of playing with race in different ways um, that they wouldn't do so much in the presence of folks of color. And that's really kind of the, um, the, the thesis of this book is that that what we found very clearly is that whites will oftentimes exhibit very different behavior when they are by themselves or when they think they're by themselves as compared to um, when they are in or when they think that they're in um, the presence of folks of color. So using a colorblind perspective, it doesn't matter if you're black, white, purple, polka dotted, um, avoiding any mention of race or avoiding anything that could be perceived as being connected to race. So just this deep discomfort talking about race in mixed race settings. And it sort of makes sense. Truthfully, we don't have a lot of interactions with that. I think even today it can be very uncomfortable for folks, but that was different in the backstage. And um, I don't know if you want me to share a little bit about the, the backstage. So yeah. one of the, um, yeah, so one of the, the, the biggest theme that we saw in terms of the backstage was this racial joking. And um, this was done um, almost exclusively in all white settings. Um, there was a gendered component to this too. So it was disproportionately white males that would engage in this racial joking. Sometimes racial joking took place in... Um, in front stage settings as a way of showing sort of how close a group is, but um, that was relatively rare. So it was more common in the backstage. And the power of racial joking is that it's really hard to diffuse because oftentimes when somebody is challenged with it, the response is, it's just a joke. It's not meant to be taken seriously. And we're just having fun with it. And, and this is where even, you know, comedians, you know, there's many comedians who've made their, you know, careers, you know, joking about about race and and there can be a fine line between are you 
poking fun at the stereotypes to show just how absurd they are, how exaggerated they are, or are you replicating? Are you, you know, reaffirming and, um, and you know, uh, you know, reaffirming what these different stereotypes are? So that's really where some of the, the power of that racial joking comes in. Yeah, and that, that was a uh, really important part of the book. And it, it kind of also um, lays out the different roles that white actors play in that backstage space, right? So you have the protagonist assistants. So maybe you could kind of tell us yeah, what. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think what was most surprising in these racial journals is I was sort of expecting for students to kind of tell on other people. And I was really surprised by how often whites told on themselves and said, I thought this or I did this. Um, but what we what we really found, too, is that it, it was a fairly small number of whites that would instigate this kind of racial joking. And it was much more common to have students say in their journals, I felt really uncomfortable, but I didn't know I didn't I didn't want to spoil the fun. And I think that's really key that this racial joking, this racialized, this perpetuating white supremacy is seen as fun. And so, um, and so this, this sort of notion of, you know, people oftentimes don't want to be like the wet blanket at the party or, you know, sociologists, we're not invited to a lot of parties because we're not a lot of fun, <laughs> you know, because we'll call things out. And so, you know, people sometimes will say, I, I didn't want to be that person. So I was uncomfortable. So I rolled my eyes or just tried to, you know, change the topic. But um, so you have sort of different white actors in these backgrounds where, you know, you may have very few folks who are instigating it, but we also had very few whites who disrupted it actively. And so, um, you know, and, and there was a gendered component with that too. So we saw disproportionately, it was white males who would instigate the racial jokes, white females who would um, try to resist either kind of, you know, half-heartedly or, oh, stop, you shouldn't say those things. Um, and so then it becomes this sort of intersection between, you know, gender and race. And you start to see, um, you know, white males using racism as sort of a proxy for sexism, like, oh, you don't like it when I say the N-word? Well, N-word this and N-word that. And so you can see there's kind of an interesting play between, um, you know, gender oppression, racialized oppression as well. So, but m many of the students wrote about kind of the discomfort in their, their journals too, wanting to say something, making comments like I needed to muster the courage to speak out and, you know, because there, there certainly could be a cost. Um, in terms of, you know, challenging this, because the assumption is you're not going to challenge it. And I think the other thing, too, that was really surprising was that it wasn't just among, um, you know, family and friends, but white strangers, too. So we saw this backstage among white strangers, um, employers as well. And so this is where we can really see, you know, sort of just how do these different racialized stereotypes perpetuate themselves? Where's the power in this? You know, if you're talking to a police officer, if you're talking to a professor, if you're talking to, um, you know, your employer, what, you know, I mean, that's a really big kind of status differential to, you know, to speak out and to challenge against that. And so those were some of the settings that we actually saw these kinds of comments taking place. Well, it, it kind of throws the, the modern or the more recent uh, connotation of safe space into a new uh, meaning, right? So it's, where these racial performances happen and the racial person who's being racist is seen as safe. But one of the other things I thought interesting in that kind of along with that is there were a lot of excuses where he's a good guy. Yes. He just made that joke, right? Yeah. And that Absolutely. Yeah. We, we, and we certainly saw that a lot in terms of, you know, he isn't racist, you know, he's a nice guy, we're just having fun, you know, and so there was this sort of sense of, you know, we have this image of a racist as being the, you know, sort of, um, you know, clan member, or the neo-Nazi skinhead, somebody who's burning crosses. And, you know, these are just college kids. These are the best and the brightest, too. I mean, these are, you know, some of our, you know, nation's top leaders, you know, future leaders, um, you know, who are just sort of having fun with this. And so, um, so yeah, so it really does sort of challenge that notion of racism. I'm, I'm a sociologist. And so I look sort of less at the individual in terms of how is this reproducing these structures that we see in place? And how do we see, and, and the other thing is some of the students would make comments like, 
well, grandpa is racist, but he's a product of his time. Racism will end when grandpa dies. I mean, they would actually write things like that. And so, but what we saw is that no, grandpa's racism is still sort of alive and well. It's, you know, it's it's being kind of reproduced in these small kind of group dynamic kind of ways that, you know, perpetuate these racialized hierarchies that we still see today in, in you know, 2022. Well, and that's part of it going underground, right, too. So it, when the safe space was the public square, and now it has to go underground and it kind of diffuses through this humor, this humor, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so, yeah, so there's been a lot of commentary about sort of safe spaces. Who is it safe for? So who is it that it's, you know, that it's not necessarily safe for? And um, we also tend to do a lot to ensure white comfort. And so you can see that right now in terms of, you know, political, uh, you know, bills that are, you know, uh, you know, coming forward. And so the, the sort of notion that even when folks were challenged about their kind of backstage, you know, um, conversations, there was sort of the sense of like, hey, why are you, you know, kind of bringing this down? And, you know, we're just having a good time. And, you know, this isn't harming anybody as long as we're not caught. And so the context was really key in terms of there's a right context and spaces for saying it and a wrong context too. And so we spend some time looking at that sort of fluid boundary between what happens when somebody comes out where somebody thinks that they're white, but it turns out they're not completely white. So whether or not they have, um, folks of color in their family, whether or not they are, you know, multiracial. And so there's this sort of sense of, you know, I didn't mean to say it in that context or, you know, apologizing when you're caught, but not necessarily when, when you're not. And that seemed like a, a overriding fear that kind of disrupted this backspace and kind of puts on a new modern twist on the, the term passing, right? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so yeah. And I think really, I mean, it really illustrates too just how, and we ask the students as well to self-identify, you know, what their race is and, you know, they, they kept the, the journals themselves. And so, um, so yeah, so this sort of sense of, I think we think of race as being in these kind of, you know, clean cut categories and boxes that we're used to filling out on, you know, in the U.S. Census or college applications, different spaces. And so it's much more fluid and even people sort of playing with race too. And so, you know, coming out and saying, you know, why would you say that I'm not white, even if they really are white? And so this sort of sense of kind of, you know, playing around with it and, and um, you know, and not seeing it as something that is kind of a essential to who they are, but, you know, sociologists would talk about, you know, how race is socially constructed. And, and if we move from the backspace to the front stage, um, I was really interested in kind of how this spot, this area privileges uh, white people as well. Yeah. So, so in the front stage, I mean, so that's really in kind of mixed race interactions and, um, and, and certainly there were some instances where people had comfortable kind of interactions and, and engagement, but, um, but certainly we saw a lot of, um, avoidance, whites being careful about what they say, how they say it, who they, you know, are, are speaking in front of. So, you know, I recall one student who was talking about, you know, he didn't want to say we could go to, you know, a Mexican restaurant to his roommate of color because he didn't know if saying a Mexican restaurant, is that racist to say? And so I think there's a lot of um, discomfort. There's white fear, I think, in being called out as being a racist. And so, again, I think, um, you know, one thing that we really see is that we still tend to think of race and racism is individually determined based on a person's individual motivations. And so thinking like, you know, and, and even now you'll hear about these things, like, I don't know what's in his heart or her heart. I can't respond to that. And so, you know, kind of getting beyond that and saying it, it isn't so much just, you know, between individual interactions, but how does this relate to broader social structures? How does this relate to segregated social spaces in which some of the students said, I don't have a lot of interaction in the front stage because I'm mostly interacting with largely white folks. And so, um, so it certainly says a lot about, you know, who it is that, that folks are interacting with as well. Well, and, and that kind of brings me to the, you know, the last final piece of this, for me at least, was the idea that like, there we have racialized all these other minorities into stereotypes and kind of negative connotations. And the most negative thing you can say about a white person is that they're racist. And so the front 
stage is just this constant, like, I have to signal tolerance. I have to signal that I'm not a racist. Yes. Whatever, and that becomes uh, itself a form of white supremacy, correct? Yeah. And, and it certainly is this sort of performance, too. So sometimes, you know, students talking about I deliberately sat next to a person of color on the bus because I didn't want them to think that I was a racist person because I'm white. And so there, there is this sort of sense of almost performativity that's um, that's related to it. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I can just share, too. So we've started doing um, more data gathering for the journals written by the students of color. So um, and I've done some publishing on just making those comparisons between the journals written by white students and the journals written by students of color. And they are remarkably different, you know, very different. And I think there's some sense that, you know, from what I heard um, after the book came out where people said, yes, whites talk badly about folks of color, but they do it too. You know, so folks of color are talking badly about whites in the, you know, in the backstage. And what we found is that there was there's some of that taking place, but it's not as vicious, it's not as damaging, and it's not as frequent. And so, in part because folks of color don't have the institutional resources to commit broad discrimination against whites in the same way that we see white students, you know, do have that kind of um, institutional power to enact discrimination. And the other thing that we found is that the um, comments against students of color or folks of color by whites was largely relying on stereotypes. And so not necessarily relying on um, personal interactions. We found that the journals written by students of color, the anti-white comments tend to be based on a specific interaction. So one um, African-American woman talked about, you know, she was using the restroom and she saw a white woman um, use the restroom and leave without washing her hands. And she made a comment to her friends about white people are so dirty, you know, and, and that's not a nice thing to say about a whole group. Group, but that's different if it's based on a specific interaction as compared if it's something that's not based on interactions, but that's based on generic stereotypes. So we certainly are seeing some very clear differences in terms of those journals. It's interesting. And, and I would, that kind of makes sense because the, there's this, when we were talking about joking, that, that is based on, no one comes up with a racial joke. These are passed down based on these institutional. So when you were talking about being a sociologist, could you kind of maybe talk to us about the macro level a little bit? As I yeah, absolutely. And even, I mean, in my classes too, we spend a lot of time looking at racialized stereotypes and seeing where do they come from? So where are these stereotypes coming from in terms of um, some of the more prevalent um, stereotypes that showed up in the journals were things related, for example, to African-American um, criminality or laziness. We can actually track that and see those were ideologies that were created during the days of enslavement to justify a system of enslavement. And, and so these are centuries old stereotypes that, that we're relying upon. And so um, so many of the stereotypes that we see, if it's related to, um, you know, AAPI, Asian American kind of model minority, you can track that to the 1960s as a way of kind of pitting racial groups against each other. So, you know, so there's deep infrastructures in place that you can actually track it kind of historically and see where is this necessarily coming from. Um, and we just don't have that same, you know, you know, we are a culture in which if you look at it from, you know, who has access to resources, the wealth gap, housing disparities, educational gaps, uh, you know, other forms of, um, you know, home ownership. I mean, very clearly we see, you know, whites have greater access to resources as compared to, you know, to folks of color, especially BIPOC individuals, uh, African-American individuals, in, um, indigenous and and, um, and certainly uh, Latinx individuals. And so this isn't something that's individualized, but we see it in terms of, you know, the connection to the broader culture. Yeah, and thank you for that. And I think uh, we could kind of end with what would you suggest uh, we do as white people to not perform so much in both spaces? Yeah, I, I mean, I think some of it just has to do with kind of, you know, getting outside of your comfort zone you know, we certainly know in terms of reliance on stereotypes that the more people you know of that group, the greater interactions that you have that are egalitarian, that are goal oriented, that are, you know, sustaining that, you know, it's harder to rely upon those stereotypes. And so 
Much of it really has to do with um, also holding other whites accountable. And so um, certainly there's that sense that, um, you know, I, you know, I know I am listened to differently than some of my colleagues of color. And so um, it really is, you know, you know, the others have said, you know, racism is really a white problem and it's going to take white folks stepping up to the to the plate if we actually want to, you know, enact some kind of change. So not waiting for a person of color to show up and to, you know, um, disrupt, you know, different racialized kinds of comments, but it really requires white accountability. Um, and, and I'll just share, there's a fantastic book and I don't know her. Heather McGee has the sum of us. Uh, it's this book that, you know, talks about how racism harms everybody seeing this is everybody's issue and challenge. This isn't just something that's, um, you know, only impacting, um, you know, marginalized and minoritized, you know, individuals, but we all have a stake in this in terms of a shared humanity and, and shared future. And especially for young folks, recognizing you know, the U.S. is demographically changing racially, ethnically, you know, much more globally interconnected. And so we all have a stake in terms of, you know, having a more um, equitable um, and, you know, diverse workplace and school and social settings, things like that. Thanks for listening to Unpacking 1619. For more information on Heights Library 1619 Project Discussion Group, or to check out more interviews with scholars, please visit heightslibrary.org. See you next episode, wherever you listen to podcasts.